Emily. I'm here as a journalist, but also a fan. Oh, I said I wasn't going to fangirl too much, but your book, My Body, I listened to it earlier this year. I took more notes in my notes app than is healthy for a person listening to an audiobook. What made you write it? Um, thank you. That's so appreciated. I'd love to read your notes. Um, I didn't know I was writing a book when I started writing it. Um, I was just kind of writing for myself and um, I've always been an avid reader. It was sort of like a exercise almost. Um, it was also kind of a moment in my life where I was looking at my early 20s and my childhood and my political beliefs were evolving and I wanted to understand sort of how I'd come to the political beliefs that I had. So um, I started writing about my personal experiences. I know the chapter on beauty lessons, mm. this, the short vignettes of kind of experiences you had and particularly with your mother mm -hmm. over the course of growing up that kind of shape a person's body image and sense of beauty. Yeah. That made me think a lot, mm. but that's just me. What are you hearing from women? What's resonating the most with your audience? Yeah, um, it was really amazing. I did a book event last night um, where there were like 200 people, mostly young women, and a lot of people were talking about that essay. Um, different ones, obviously different moments, but I think more than a few women brought up to me sort of how early we start to learn and value and appreciate ourselves for the way we look rather and kind of above anything else. Um, and we learn to examine ourselves by comparing ourselves to other women. Um, and this for me started before I could even speak. I mean, one of the vignettes in the, um, in the essay is um, about, you know, saying to my mom like, oh, that woman's just jealous because, you know, I learned the concept of jealousy so, so young. Um, and, you know, I think it's not a specific, it wasn't necessarily my mom and like who she was. I think it's something that's embedded into our culture um, as women. And in some ways, I think a lot of the lessons my mom was trying to teach me and instill in me were to protect me and to, you know, help me understand. It's so difficult too, because as you said, you, we learn it from an early age. Mm -hmm. I had a mother who was not ever wearing makeup, told mm -hmm. me not to wear makeup. And yet I danced mm -hmm. and I watched media. Yeah. I consumed media and you develop your own sense of what are beauty standards. And then I balance that with, and you talk about this eloquently in the book about the pressure to be feminist mm -hmm. and then you are making money off mm -hmm. of your body. And some people saying that's not feminist. Mm -hmm. What do you tell people who say that? Well, I used to really kind of die on the word feminism. I was so important to me that I identified as a feminist, but um, I now kind of have evolved a little bit. And I do think that there's a feeling of like, you have to be a part of a club and Roxanne Gay, you know, coined the term bad feminist. So I guess I'll just take that um, and I'll, I'm fine with it. <laughs> Now, you found your voice kind of accidentally. You didn't realize you were writing a book. Mm. What advice would you give the women watching this video on finding their voice and using it? Oh my gosh, it's so hard. Um, you have to trick yourself. That's how I did it. I tricked myself into thinking that I wasn't writing. Um, so I used the notes app on my phone and I kind of took as much pressure away from it as I possibly could. So you kind of have to trick yourself into thinking that you're not looking for your voice and then just start talking. <laughs> um, I do use audio notes. I mentioned to you um, earlier. I think that, you know, think about tap into kind of the way that you talk to the people that are closest to you, um, as particularly as a woman, I would say other women and how you talk to your best friends or your sister or your mother, or whatever your relationship is with them. Um, and then don't be afraid. Talk like you talk to your friends and your sisters. I think that's mm -hmm. such a good advice because it's so easy to get in your head. Yes, it is. Yeah. I think also trying not to compare yourself. Um, to other voices, yeah. I don't know if it was Brene Brown or someone else mm. once said uh, comparison is the death of creativity. It is, yeah. I wanna close by asking you, you know, we're in a difficult moment in time mm. for women right now, whether you look at employment rates or what's happening with reproductive rights or yeah. around the world with girls' education in Afghanistan. How do you choose to use your platform to speak out? Because you have a massive social platform. Mm. There are so many people listening to you. Mm -hmm. How and when do you decide to speak out? So I decide to speak out when I'm really pissed off. Um, sometimes that means taking a beat to um, kind of let the emotions subside, but really 
you know, hone in on exactly what I want to say and make sure that it's, you know, eloquent and concise and that I know exactly what I'm standing for and what I'm putting out into the world. So, you know, that I feel good about it. Um, but, you know, I try to be very consistent with my politics. I mean, I don't try. It's just I, I don't feel the pressure to speak on things that I don't really feel like I have an understanding or political belief around. Um, and then the things I do, I I wait for moments where I feel like I'm adding something that, you know, hasn't been said before or it feels like it's an important moment to to add my voice to the conversation. Will you be writing another book anytime soon? I definitely want to. Um, I have a lot of things going on right now and writing is a process that um, you kind of can't control. So we'll see, but I definitely plan on writing more. Well, we hope you do. Emily, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me.